So I'm just super thrilled to be here and very honored um, to be sharing the stage with Winston Pinnock, uh, the winner of this year's, or one of the winner of this year's Win Campbell Prizes for Drama. Thank you so much for being here. Um, personal story, I actually w uh, met Winston in 2018 uh, when I was doing a residency at the National Theater, where Winsome was actually the first black British woman to ever be produced by the National mm -hmm. Theater. Um, and at the time, they were reviving your play Leave Taking from, was it 1988 or was it? It's from, yeah, 1986, I think. Wow. Yeah, a long wow. time ago. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I, had, I was there uh, as a kind of at the request of the National Theater to create a sort of forum for like cross-cultural and cross-pollination conversation between black British and black American playwright traditions and just sort of investigating like why are we so far apart and yet there are these interesting ties going way back when and, um, and your name was evoked again and again and again because I believe you were considered to be part of a pioneering generation of these writers in the early 90s and it's very fascinating, interesting, but you're referred to as the godmother <laughs> Of black British writing, which just seems really rude because usually you ask someone before you want them to be a godmother. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think it's you know it's difficult to really articulate for American audiences just how a ex excellent and of a writer you are, and I just I'm very jealous of a lot of your work. But just the profundity of your influence, it's hard to really describe this context. But we are literally in the in the in the presence of someone I would consider one of the most important writers working today, like a legend or owner, right? So I just want to say that out loud. That's very kind of you. And well, not very kind, tell your friends. Um, so I felt like, you know, the, the way to start, I guess, this conversation is really to begin about with Turner, since he's in the title, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I'll confess that I'm not a particular uh, Turner specialist or art historian in any way, mm -hmm. um, but obviously you have a relationship to him, or at least he lives in your consciousness in a way, and I'm curious about your first encounter with his work um, and then possibly the encounter with specifically the slave ship, which is the painting yeah. in question, right? Well, it's the painting that I have a relationship with, in a way, and not with Turner per se. Um, but it's a really fascinating painting, and I'm not entirely sure when I first saw it. But, of course, in Britain we only see reproductions of it, because although Turner painted it in around 1840, it... Um, passed through several owners. It, its first owner was John Ruskin, who was an art critic and who was Turner's um, biggest fan, if you like. Mm -hmm. He actually, a lot of people didn't understand Turner's work, and Ruskin did. And so he wrote um, about Turner's paintings, and his father bought the painting, The Slave Ship, for him. But he found the subject and the painting so disturbing after a while because he had his own issues, you know, mental health issues, and he sold it. He couldn't live with it anymore. He couldn't bear to look at it and sold it, and it passed through a few owners. Um, but he was the only British owner of that painting. Um, so it was sold to American um, patrons of the art and then was given to the Museum of Fine Arts, was it? Yeah. And um, which is where I, I spent, I, I was only at the MFA for a, a day, but I spent a lot of time just standing in front of that painting with very nervous security guards watching me just stand there. Just waiting to um, snatch it. Yeah. Staring at the painting, but it's a fascinating painting from men, on many, many levels. Mm -hmm because it is meant to be a, an historical painting and some people think that its subject is the Zong Massacre. The Zong Massacre is quite a, a famous um, event in history, in British history of the uh, slave trade, where, um, and, and Turner would have been a child when this happened, uh, but a slave sh ship, carrying um, enslaved Africans, the um, crew, the captain and crew, through the slaves, um, sorry, I used the word slaves, enslaved people overboard, um, and many of them drowned. And they did that because there was a lack of water on board the ship, people were getting ill, and so they threw them overboard, and there was a court case that ensued after this, and the court case, was really focused on the ship owner's um, 
pursuit of damages, if you like. Mm -hmm. They made an insurance claim for loss of cargo. I don't think it was ever resolved one way or the other whether they, I don't think they ever got the money. But So this is a very famous case that Turner would have read about as an older man because it took place, the massacre took place when he would have been about six years old, yeah. but he read a lot. And so people think this painting, which um, is called The Slave Ship, it's it's got a longer title actually, which is Slave, um, Slavers Throwing Overboard the Sick and the Dying Typhoon Coming On. I think that's its title. But you never act, so it, it describes this action, but it's never actually shown in the painting. You don't, it, you, it, it sounds as though the painting depicts the action of this massacre taking place, but actually it's the aftermath of the massacre. Right, right. Um, the violence is almost like a ghost, you know. The, sorry? The violence is almost like a ghost Absolutely. in the painting. Yeah, it is, mm -hmm. and the ship appears like a ghost ship. Mm -hmm. Could I ask you to just describe, just for folks who may not, I wish we could like blow, like yeah, project it here you for you to see. I don't think I can describe oh. it. It is, it is an incredibly beautiful yeah. painting, and people who are familiar with um, Turner's seascapes will recognize the sort of composition of the painting, mm -hmm. its, uh, its beauty. It, there is a sort of beautiful, almost like sunset. Yeah, there's a profound use of light that is sort of profound almost like a main character in it. Yeah. it. It's a landscape, but it does sort of, it's the horrors and the details, and yeah. so it kind of requires a certain amount of engagement. So in the distance, in the, in the background, we see a kind of ghostly looking ship sailing away. And in the foreground, amongst the kind of detailings of the waves, we notice body parts and chains, and we realize we're witnessing um, people right, drowning. There are, there are yeah. sort of hands reaching yeah. out of the water. But the, the um, representation of figures and sea creatures, if you like, in that painting is quite odd, mm -hmm. cartoon-like almost, mm -hmm. which is why I think some people found it a strange painting. I did read somewhere that a group of schoolboys, you know, they would queue to look at the painting and some schoolboys um, stopped laughing. But I think that was because there is a, you can see a woman's breasts, um, an enslaved woman's breasts or part of, a, of, of them in there and a leg. Um, but there is another idea that this painting doesn't depict the Zong massacre at all. And this is what became fascinating to me because some people think that it's actually a contemporary piece and that what um, Turner was actually depicting was the ongoing um, the slave trade, the continuation of the slave trade after abolition. Mm -hmm. So the illegal slave trade, where the Royal Navy, if they discovered this activity going on, would pursue these illegal slave ships and um, send up flares as maybe as a warning, some people think, so that these ships could get away. But what would happen was that the, sh the slave ships, these illegal, this illegal, uh, for this illegal trade, would throw their enslaved, kidnapped Africans overboard. Um, and so some people think that that is what the painting is actually. So, so that was fascinating to me because then, if that's true, then Turner is saying, this hasn't ended. This is about now. And that for me was a very interesting um, way of see of looking at history. So this is both. It can be the Zong massacre, mm -hmm. but it's also contemporary. Mm -hmm. And then the idea that because this this painting was made perhaps misunderstood, um, that it was almost in looking at it. Of course, it's speaking to you across time and space. Mm -hmm. So it's almost as though it was written. It was composed or put together for our time. Mm. And, um, and so that was really interesting to me. And because I was wanting to write about the legacy of the slave trade, um, when I was growing up, we would have these conversations all the time about the impact of 
enslavement on our community, uh, you know, various, I don't know, behaviors, um, the legacy of deprivation, of, um, but, but also in things like uh, music, you know, tr uh, that this music that was um, an act of resistance, you know, that that survives through the ages or traces of it survive in contemporary music. Hmm. And um, things like, you know, the legacy of health issues in the black community and actually in the white, in, 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 in the whole, in, in the whole of society. Things like diabetes, the mania for sugar, you know, which started then our, 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 our obsession with that. So the fact that we live with this legacy in our everyday lives. Um, so I wanted to explore that a little bit. And it's very difficult to write about, um, you know, the slave trade and its legacy without, um, you know, there are various tropes that kind of almost trap you when you're, and, and you know, and your play, an Octoroon, was a, a sign of the things that you can do to resist this, mm. you know. And so I was trying to find a way of exploring this. Um, and so I was exploring lots of different ideas about resistance and um, but and and trying to find a form for the play which took some of its dramaturgy from that painting mm. you know from the fact that you've got um, this uh, well there are lots of things that influence me in that painting the fact that it's an incredibly beautiful painting um, about a very difficult subject. I mean, I say that in the play, I think. Mm. You know, there is a scene where, the, where these women are actually just looking at the painting and talking about it. Mm. And um, I also read somewhere that um, I was reading about uh, you know, the, the Holocaust and representations of that in art, and about how, again, how problematic it is to write about history because um, when you of course we, we you know we, we create characters etc and when you when you do that you you have to somehow sympathize with all the characters you write about and this thing I read was um, discussing the fact that that's so dangerous because you can then um, avoid the sort of seriousness, if you like, or yeah. the complexity of the situation. So I was having to think about all this kind of thing. And also, um, while I was researching, I found it really traumatic. You know, anybody who looks into this subject will find it really quite harrowing to read some of the reports. Um, I read one inquiry by abolitionists who on the ground um, just observing uh, life on a plantation, and it could have been an investigative, a piece of investigative journalism in The Guardian, you know. Mm. And um, I kind of wanted to, I didn't want, <laughs> I didn't want to re traumatize the audience, so it's finding ways to. To kind of have the audience, and, and also because I felt that when you're submerged in this and you're being traumatized, you're feeling something, and that's, you know, that's it, it's, it's great to empathize. But at the same time, you're not always standing back and thinking. You used the word reflection, we were talking earlier, and you're not reflecting, you're not thinking about this, you're not thinking about these ideas of representation. So there are various tropes you see all the time. Um, as it's mentioned in the play, um, the black body being whipped, etc. That is, you know, you, you can't actually write about enslavement without actually touching on that. Mm -hmm. But in the play, there's a scene where you do see a whipping, but then you realize it's actually, 
not real in the way yeah. that things are not real on stage, but then they are real because you're watching them. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of having, you, having the audience think about that. So it's as, it's more, it's as much about representation mm -hmm. as it is uh, you know, about the subject itself. Yeah. It's about its representation. I'll say, you know, I want to try to describe the play a little bit for the audience as well. Yeah, sure. So it, it is, you know, it, it's surprisingly enough, it's easy to read the description and think, this is an adaptation of a painting, but it's, very, it's way more than that. And it actually is a historical drama, but it's, for me, it's less, you know, there, a lesser writer would have written the play about the court case, you know. But I feel that what the kind of real poetry and genius you brought into it was actually, it becomes about what history itself is as a phenomenon, right? It, in, the way, in the way that theater does best, it sort of brings the audience closer to those thoughts about, you know, I mean, the argument I said to you earlier, I think that the play itself is about the way that history has deformed our imaginations, right? And specifically history as related to this work. And, and it's sort of, yes, about Turner painting this painting, but it's also about um, a contemporary actress who is also, God, it's going to sound terrible as I describe it. I'm sorry, but she's like, a, she's like in a Star Trek-like franchise, right? And she's doing this prestige film. She's gone back to Britain and do a prestige film uh, when which she plays an enslaved woman. And there's a kind of small story there about how she's wrestling with the cuts that have been forced upon it and her character by the network. But also she and her engagement with the Turner painting itself, which is in theory the basis of the movie, is herself experiencing an interesting madness which manifests itself as these very surreal, interesting, theatrical manifestations, right? And the whole thing, to me, has this wild kind of kaleidoscopic feeling, right? It's not, it's, it's very much, even though it has definitely got a story and it has a beginning and a middle and end, there's something about it that is, in a way that Brits are so good at, it has almost this Shakespearean density of plot where you're also following Turner, but you're following her, and you're following a young boy who lives in her world, but also lives in another world, and it, it's, and it should work. That's what's amazing about it, and that's really the testament to how it's so great, and yet it does. It fully gives you almost a painterly feeling because the subject, it is a composition, but there are so many details inside of it that it's easy to get lost in one after another, and there is just like a real scope to it that's hard to articulate, you know? <laughs> And I would say, too, that part of the game of, you know, I've heard in the, in the play, actually, the Turner uh, painting is described as sublime, which, as I, if I like dust off my grad school brain, you know, was rooted in this notion of a thing that is, this is the dumb version, and please, art historians, pipe up. You know, it's something that's kind of so horrifying, but you can't look away, right? It's a kind of mode of engagement or, or effective entanglement with uh, something you're witnessing that is, creating sensations of revilement, and yet you can't not stay with it, mm. right? And I think that the play does that, you know, in some way. I mean, and tell me if I'm, please tell me I'm I think, wrong. I but. think you're right. Um, but there was also, I mean, really quite simply, when you walk around London, this idea of the legacy, when you walk around London and you hear, the, you hear and see these echoes of the past, and so, the way I was putting it together was trying to capture that somehow. Mm. That these, you, you hear these um, voices, if you like, of the past. And then that, you know, quite simply was what I was trying to do. And I didn't, I felt that the stories would link in ways that were very subtle and that you, you that, that I didn't want you to be thinking, oh, because it's kind of neat. You can do that neat thing where the past and the present are, are, are linked in very obvious ways. Mm. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. But these stories aren't no, necessarily linked in that way, and I, I was interested in experimenting with that somehow, that you were just giving impressions. And it works. I mean, I think, you know, just in, thinking of, in, in conversation with the painting itself, we talked about sort of the seascape that's kind of hinted at through the transparency of its surface, and beneath it are these strange creatures, right? Yeah. And I think your play has this interesting game where some of the scenes have like a below the surface and above the surface conversation happening, right? I'm thinking of the scene where Mermaid is talking to a drunk Turner <laughs> while he's being confronted yeah. by his shipmate, and that, you know, and in, of course, there's a very easy 
kind of like pop Freudian reading to have here about like, you know, the, the unconscious is the, is the bottom of the ocean, right? That there's a world in which like as human beings, we live both on the surface of life and deep inside our interior. And there's a way in which you kind of make that manifest on the page. And there's this incredible scene, which I have to, which is the, when Lou visits her dying grandfather and the way that you turn this motif of the slave ship three times, right? We kind of, you know, she's walking into it kind of in her state of madness over her relationship to this play and this uh, movie in which she's um, a captive on a, on a ship. But then she kind of describes very casually the work she's doing as this Star Trek captain. And you hear or you understand in a very vivid way how all of the rhetorical energies of something like Star Trek are rooted very much in these ancient notions of piracy, colonization, yeah. you know, that, that even that even in our most progressive uh, form of speculation in the imagination, we're still haunted by the practices of, of trafficking. Yeah. Trafficking, conquest, the, the sovereignty, right? The right to own or take. Yeah. And, that, and then, you know, her dead father in this very below the water hallucinogenic moment gets up out of the bed and begins to describe his experience as a Windrush, right? Like That's right, Windrush. And you're suddenly like, holy crap, like these three, you know, the, the, that constellation, I mean, I get chills thinking about it, does, a, does that theater thing, where yeah. suddenly we're forced to live with these three very different ideas of ship's passage and how they intersect with, you know, belonging and captivity and betrayal. Yeah, I felt- It's just really elegant. The ship was a, a character, really, mm -hmm. and the way that the ship was transformed. There's an even bigger story with the Windrush. This was one of the first ships that took these um, people from the Caribbean who were migrating to England after the first war, uh, to Britain after the first, second world war, sorry. Um, so the Windrush made its first journey to Britain, or one of its first journeys in about 1948. Um, but that ship, you know, I was interested in the way these ships were mm -hmm. constantly transforming. Crossing, yes. they're, they're shipwrecked, then they're resurrected, and then they take on another identity. Um, and the same thing actually happened to the Windrush, which was actually, historically, it was a German ship used for holiday makers, and then it was used to transport, um, you know, the Nazis used it to transport prisoners and then it became this, you know, it was bought by the British after the war. It transported um, migrants from the Caribbean and then it was shipwrecked. So it's yeah. still somewhere, <laughs> you know, it's, it's shipwrecked somewhere. They know yeah. where it is. So, so this, uh, you know, this is all real, mm -hmm. you know, that um, uh, these, these journeys, you're right, that, that, that's what I started thinking about. There was something you said about um, our thinking being deformed by history. And I'd been, there was another play I wrote sort of at a similar time, a very, really short play called Tituba, which was about the um, enslaved woman in, um, who was involved in the Salem witch trial. Mm -hmm. And she has a part in Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible, mm -hmm. a minor role. Mm -hmm. Even though her role in the event was massive, she 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 played a huge part in this um, event. But that play is really interesting for that because it shows the interplay between history and reality and how they both impact on each other. So Tituba was not. An, Af an enslaved African woman, apparently. Right. But she was of indigenous. course, an yeah. indigenous mm -hmm. woman. But she became African because mm -hmm. of well, it, the yeah. crucible. Right. And also, what is the value of the signifier of blackness, yeah. right? Like, why couldn't she be indigenous? Why was it necessary yeah. during the McCarthy era yeah. for Titcha to be exactly. cast as a black exactly. bodied woman? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, so it was interesting what you were saying about, you know, the way that. Our thinking is deformed by history, and um... and I would say too. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, no, it's fine. but you know, I always say that as someone who's like made a career out of writing about slavery, um, you know, I always say that there's nothing that's been more damaging to our understanding of that time than film, television, and theater. Right? That 
in some ways the uh, not, you know, we have been we have been in charge with a site of knowledge making, or we I say, my I cite my past brethren who mostly don't look like me um, who did this work, and somehow. What's interesting is I feel tasked as an artist of color in this space to like undo that bad work, <laughs> you know, or to rethink it. And I think it's impossible to ultimately write about an something that is an absence, right? This yeah. very canonical idea of the social death that is, that is slavery doesn't allow you to give it voice in a social form because mm. they're, they're, like, you, like you say a ton, many times in this play that the stories of those people are not inaccessible. They're they inaccessible. died with them, right? But, but I like what you uh, write at the beginning of um, an octoroon where you say nobody knows what these people sounded like. I don't know what these people sounded mm -hmm. like, something like that you yeah. say, and neither do you. Right. And that, that gives you sort of license because you sort of do know what they sounded like mm -hmm. if, you, if you, because they sound like me. Right, right. If you really do believe this, there is this legacy, mm -hmm. this heritage, then I, I feel that I have a right to try. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and I know because it's theater. Who knows what anyone sounded like? Totally, you know, totally. And I think too, Hamlet when you say like, like you sort of know, I'm interested yeah. in that half knowledge, right? Because yeah. it requires you at some point to ask yourself, what am I filling it in with, mm. right? What is the provenance of these assumptions, mm. right? Yeah. And that's and that's maybe where the human comes in. Yeah, you know, it's it's that idea that, um, or maybe, I kind of know, because I'm trying to imagine what could have been mm -hmm. what what they could have what they mm -hmm. what they lost and what what they could have had in mm -hmm. that to some degree my life is as a result of what they lost i'm aware of that you know that i i am here mm -hmm. because of what they couldn't have or what they gave up and I feel that, therefore, you know, in, in, in trying to say these things, I know it's not, it's not real, but I'm saying them for myself almost and others like me. I'm paying homage to mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. people and I sort of think it doesn't matter that I don't really know or that I don't have. Mm -hmm. But I think material. that also, mm -hmm. I think that's sort of a, I mean, this is, becomes a conversation about theater and history because yeah. there is this idea, it's so funny to kind of have to bring the crucible in this room because mm -hmm. I think it's treated as a upstanding piece of historical drama mm -hmm. in the sense that I think people teach it in high schools mm -hmm. because they think of it as a vessel for a communication of historical truth. Mm. When actually anyone who's taken half a class on it, it's like, wait a minute, there's all kinds of weird invention happening here. Yeah. And it forces that question about, well, you know, he wasn't actually here to teach a lesson. He was here to talk about the present tense yeah. witch hunt yeah. energy in his audience. Exactly. Right. But there's often this hilarious burlesque of the the, of the theatrical act or the dramatic ask, act as having to communicate the truth of something as it was, yeah. right? Rather than thinking of it as almost a piece of art, right? It's yeah. a site of, um, of contemplation. It's an invitation to explore that interiority of yours yeah. and seek a different understanding of how you relate to the world. You brought up earlier, you know, when you talk about uh, the slave ship, that people say it's either based on the Zong massacre or it's not. But actually, as a painting, it, it's, it's all of that, right? It's, exactly. the, its power is that it's signifiers that invite us to recognize that one massacre does not Absolutely. Account for the I tragedy the of the practice, right? Yes. Um, and I think and what's amazing, I love Tichuba, your play Tichuba, because it is, for the first time in my life, I understood Tichuba as not exactly a victim, right? Mm -hmm. That it, in, in, um, I, it's, I don't, it's so hard to talk about plays, you don't want to spoil it for people, you want people to like go out and read it, run out and buy these things. Um, but, you know, it, it's, a, it's a solo show, it's one woman telling kind of the story or the prequel, really, <laughs> of what, how she wound up on that stand and her actions on that stand and why she names the women she named. And by giving that depth of dimension to her, you give her an interesting agency in spite of her kind of outward per, uh, 
presentation as a captive. Yeah. And it's amazing. It's amazing because I think you also, it's about the imagination, it's about language, it's about, you know, I was just at an amazing talk earlier today with Margot Jefferson and, and Daphne Brooks and they were talking about um, both amazing black female critics, feminist critics, and Margot uh, was talking about an obsession with At the Waters and her performance in Member of the Wedding. And she said for her, it was a radical thing because it was the first time she was seeing a black woman as an actor play a character who made sure to communicate that she was feeling things inside, that, mm -hmm. that she was preoccupied with her interiority. And that's actually the great work, I think, of repairing the dramatic enterprise is yeah. there's an absence of interiority in these Absolutely. women and characters Absolutely. as they as they exist currently in the canon. Yeah, so and I think the, the complexity. Yes. And, well, you lose what it's real what theater is about. Yeah. You know, you lose what what you're actually communicating about a character is that there's a there's a depth there. But it's interesting know? what you say about absence and you know when when one is writing um, about this subject that there is an absence of the voices of the subjects of, of, of this. And actually there are traces in acts of resistance because although the voices aren't captured, um, certainly not in the British history, what is captured are sometimes quite subtle acts of resistance. For example, uh, in this um, inquiry that I read, where you would read about people um, just, well, and it wasn't just running away. You know, they, they, uh, much of the resistance or some of it was, you know, was huge, like, um, you know, um, people overcoming, overpowering the ship's crew and getting away, but some of it was more subtle than that. Mm. You know, but there was constantly this resistance. And for me, that gives you the sense of that interiority. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. That actually, that's, there was agency. that's what I yeah. hear. Mm -hmm. That's what I, yes, I hear that agency in those acts. And it's the same with Tidjo, mm. you know, that she confesses and whatever. And, and, and there's a strategy there. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. is a mind that is working out a strategy to resist, to rebel, and to ultimately avenge. survive and avenge mm -hmm. in, in, in that play, yes, mm -hmm. to avenge, um, but to survive, yeah. And I think there's something, I'd love to, just to, this is gonna be an impossible question, I'm so sorry, <laughs> but it's a motif I detect in the play that I wanna see if I can out a bit. So, and it has to do with the painting itself, and that, so the character Lou has an engagement with it that <gasps> drives her mad in a way that echoes Ruskin's madness, which we can never mm -hmm. fully understand the depth of. But I said, it seems to have something to do with the limitations of Turner's gesture in the painting of it, right? That somehow it's easy to interpret this painting as somehow an abolitionist gesture or a political gesture. And that given that it was very unlikely that that painting would be viewed by a person of color or a black, pers black identified person, there's this interesting idea of whiteness and perception that seems to haunt the play, mm -hmm. right? And this idea that it, it wasn't quite enough to just de force a viewer to look on, well, it's actually a debate within the play, right? That mm -hmm. they're kind of discussing, like, what is the point of this composition, mm -hmm. right? And I felt like there was something happening in, there's another scene at the very end, right, where Lou sort of skips the awards night yeah. and her white co-star, uh, co wins an award, comes back, pretends it's for her, but then he says he actually went on stage and refused to accept the award and accepted it in her name. And she has to kind of explain to him how that gesture has nothing to do with her, mm. you know? And I'm curious for you, like, do you think, is that a, that idea of kind of laboring against and under someone else's perceptions feels like a, like a, something you're mining, maybe. And I wonder, is, is, is there a, you know, sorry, I told you this to be like a horrific question. I'm so sorry, it's but just hard. stay yeah. with me. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, for example, during COVID, there was this kind of moment called We See White American Theater. I don't know if you heard about this, where a lot of anonymous kind of um, black identified theater artists and allies kind of banded together and um, kind of wrote this manifesto and were kind of in their, I think, words sort of 
outing something about power structures and whiteness as it mm -hmm. operates inside of, or white supremacy as it operates inside of the American theater. And it created an interesting debate, actually. And I was not a co-signer on that letter, and I can go into why at a different event. Um, but part of, part of the issue was this notion of what, what, is it, what does white theater mean, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what does it mean to attach a, or black theater even, what does it mean to attach a histor historically specific affinity as a label onto the work when in fact theater itself is a very radical thing. It's just an act of group looking. And you actually can't control the audience that shows up, you know? And I guess I wondered, is there something in your project that is about wrestling with, I mean, when we talk about rep representation, that's what we're really talking mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious about your point of view on what theater is supposed to be for everyone, right? Yeah. I get the sense that you don't really have an audi ideal audience in mind. You do write with kind of interesting openness that challenges people to who feels comfortable, who doesn't, right? Who feels yeah. privileged or who doesn't? That's and, right, and you know that not everyone's going to get it, but you just take a risk anyway and, and put these ideas out there. Um, I don't know why Turner painted this in the way that he did, because it's quite different to other paintings that are part of the abolitionist movement, because in those paintings, you do see bodies and you do see, um, you know, you see people um, represented, you see them performing their suffering. Um, and therefore you see these victims. And in this painting, it's not quite like that. This is, this is um, truer in some ways in terms of the horror it depicts, and I find that fascinating, and I don't understand why he, how, or how he arrived at that, and perhaps it's because, you know, I don't know, just the artist that he was, because I'm not sure if he had this, he wouldn't have had this, um, or would he have had these thoughts? Is it, is it, Ha, ha, well, you know, because you are forced to ask questions about this. There's, there's no other way of looking at this painting than to try to make sense of it. You might try to force it into certain conventional ways of seeing. You might force yourself to look at it in the ways that you look at other paintings um, that were part of that movement. But I don't think you can, and I know some people are critical of this painting, um, you know, because I, I read somewhere that someone felt that in order to create this, there is an element of masochism in it, of, of pleasure mm. in depicting this kind of suffering. Again, we don't know that, because you could say that of me or mm -hmm. of anyone who mm -hmm. writes about this kind of thing. I mean, and I. I'm aware of that, the, this idea of this pleasurable... Yeah, the pornographic the quality pornographic of the quality. torture porn is the exactly, phrase. Exactly, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. I, I am aware of that. And of course, as a writer, you're always aware of that because mm. you kind of um, construct it when mm. you're writing. And that's why in this play, it's so... Um, you're constantly... Uh, I'm constantly stepping back from it. Yeah. there and is sort of having a conversation with myself, really, mm -hmm. and, and with the audience, even though I'm not a character in the play or whatever, you know. But there's definitely that. There's definitely a, a sort of representation of my, of me, of, of my mm. relationship to both theatre, writing, and that painting. Mm. I think, I mean, so many things I want to say. I mean, we should also open up to questions, as I think so. I don't know. No one's telling me what time it is. Um, but there is something about that idea of the, con you know, consumable suffering is, is sort of ultimately like the, the kind of tentpole of propaganda, right? That that's, it's sort of in, in depicting the illusion of a body being torn apart or exploded that you can then generate the feelings that you redirect into political action. And there is an amazing amount of withhold. You know, as you're talking and I'm thinking about the painting and again, I wish we could have shared this with everyone. If you don't know the painting, definitely take out your phone and Google it. But it, there is a, 
you, do, you don't see the hero or the villain, right? You, the, the perpetrator is on a ship that's fading into a distance, and you just see the arms of people or body parts who you actually don't know if they're on this side of life or not, mm. right? So it's difficult to actually place um, yeah. This is that sublime quality again. It's difficult yeah. to place. You, it's like you're dealing with artifacts. You know, you're yeah. dealing with the bones of something, and you want to. Under, it's like SVU or something like that. You know. Do you know? Um, I mean, you've just <laughs> you've just opened up a whole other thing in a way because no, you don't see the perpetrators. You don't mm -hmm. know what's happened to them, mm -hmm. and it is like a ghost ship. Yeah. So that is, you know. Um, Oh gosh, I, 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 you know, there, there's, there's, there's a whole yeah. other. Yeah. Because I think there's, I always wonder them. if, as an audience member, that it's your predic, you know, your power is based on this notion that you are there to judge, mm. and if there's no one to judge, I think you're left in a space of, of anxiety, you know. And I think yeah. also there's something about your play. I mean, it's named um, Rockets and Blue Lights, which is the Turner painting he painted after this, right? And a gesture of cleansing, maybe. Maybe. Or, or I mean, they, they were actually exhibited at the same time. Hmm. Um, yeah, so I think I'm, I'm not exactly sure when Rockets and Blue Lights was painted, but they were exhibited together. Um, and I sort of, you know, that, that's, that's me. I, I'm kind of saying that he did it because it's beautiful. Hmm. I mean, in a different way to the slave ship, the um, Rockets and Blue Lights is the quality of light in that picture, you do feel cleansed, you know, after mm -hmm. looking at the spaceship. Yeah. There is something um, about it that is, I wouldn't say joyful, but it's, you know. It somehow resolves something. It, it, re it, yeah. it resolves and heals something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know, or, or, or has but that's what's so powerful about the play. I'm, I'm just gushing over you in this play because I love it, but I really do have, like, it has, like, masterpiece vibes to me, but I hate throwing that word around. But um, that part of what I think what the play is asking of me as like a descendant of slaves is, you know, there is a, there is a haunting that you live with yeah. under this history. And beyond, you know, making reparations, solving the mystery of it, repairing the voices who were unheard, you know, is there ever the hope of cleansing, right? Is there ever, that seems to be Lou's journey throughout. It's like, yeah. she can't shake this haunting, you know, and it's a real, question for the world, but definitely for the yes. work of, is, is another painting enough? You know, is mm -hmm. a painting capable of, of healing? Is, art, is, it, is theater capable of healing anything, right? What is, it, what is it in relationship to history? Is it just a, you know, well, hurricane in our... I think the healing is in, in recognition, and in the UK, we are just coming to terms with this history. We often don't talk about it, and there aren't many plays produced um, by British writers on this subject. There is a kind of, in the same way that the painting lives in Boston, mm -hmm. you know, we can't face, you know, the, the British mm. slave trade, we can't face it. And that has to be right. the first, you know, the, the, the way in which we do effect some kind of... Um, that's got to be the first stage in reparation, is just acknowledging that it happened and its effect is continuing, ongoing legacy. I am thought about, I'm thinking about the loss of Queen Elizabeth and the, uh, the many responses, and then the responses to the responses, which themselves were an interesting indicator of the affective disjunct yeah. within the empire. You know, when I, when I was looking at it, at the MFA, it, um, when you see the brush strokes and have a sense of the way in which it was painted, the energy of those brush strokes, the kind of, um, it's kind of crazy, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? And you of course, you can't see that in a representation like this. But you see the, the, the sort of, you know, because it's almost 3D. <laughs> mm. Yeah, and I think you don't quite capture the quality of the light, which is, is yeah. you're so aware of the color and density of that sunscape, basically. But you see how the ship itself kind of disappears in the surf. And I always felt like there's, you see the hands here, you see a leg here, you know, and you also see a kind of, that animal life is sort of also 
Uh, wait, that, is that a breast? No. Yeah, the... I thought that was a fish. Oh, no, there are fish, though. These are fish. These are fish. Yeah. Down in the corner there. Oh, oh, wow. I think. I mean, this is the thing. The whole, the whole, this whole depiction of the seascape makes you kind of constantly question what you're looking at because it's almost Dionysian in some sense, like, right? Things are kind of, bl identities are blurring. The, you know, the human and the animal and the, and the natural elements are kind of one wash that you have to work hard to discern in some way. And it's difficult to find, you know, for me, that feeling of grief or sadness has to happen after a lot of labor because I have to understand what I'm looking at first, you know? Yeah. It's not quite in front of me the way you, you know, like we said, like a more yeah. abolitionist forward painting from the era might represent this, you know, this thing. This little area here of like white, if you like. Mm -hmm. What is it? Is what it, is that? Yeah. Yeah. What, it's like some sort of ghostly like a cloth. presence or yeah. a cloth or something. It's, it's, it's. Yeah. Right. It's weird. It's strange. And it's so interesting too, this idea that this, this, I guess, half-chained person, it, it's almost communicating as if they've just been freshly thrown in the water, but the ship is so far away, and there's all these kind of... I have uh, read somewhere that this half, you know, there's someone with a manacle on one leg, that it can sometimes, um, it might, you know, that sometimes women were used as, I don't know, mistresses for want of a better word for the captain mm -hmm. and then that person would have just one manacle on because mm. they had like half freedom mm. and this is a female thank you. thank you this is an amazing amazing conversation written dying to see the play absolutely dying dying to see it so it's um, I, just thinking about ruskin's description of this work in modern painters uh, he uses the phrase the multitudinous seas incarnadine which shows that there's already drama in it because it's coming from Macbeth and I'm wondering whether that came into your thinking the idea of the the, the blood and the, the the lines of the guilty ship turning the whole world bloody in the way that Ruskin describes um, is that is that has, has that had any any part in your in your thinking um. No, not because I, well, because I was really focused on Lou, the character of Lou and her world, really. And um, I'm not sure I heard everything you said there, by the way. Sorry. It was, it was Ruskin oh, quoting true. Shakespeare. Yeah. You know, in his description of the way that the sea was turned bloody, yeah. you know, the multitudinous yes. seas incarnadine yeah. from, from Macbeth. And I just, I just wondered that because there's already a kind of presence of the play, play a presence of drama in Ruskin's writing, if that had had any, any ripple effect on, on you. Mm, no. I will really. say, I mean, you do have an interesting moment where a character does describe the blood, the bloodiness yeah, of the sky. She does, yeah. yeah. Yeah, she does. As kind of an irony of the piece. Yeah. And, um, and you do have an amazing intertext with The Tempest. That's which, right. Which is another amazing moment of like, yeah. you know. Because, yeah, I, that, because of course that's about shipwrecks. And yeah, and slavery. <laughs> and slavery. Yeah. Colonization and yeah. So, the, so there is an awareness of that. And they, there are quotes from Shakespeare in the play from The Tempest. Yeah. I'll say that one of the things I love about the work is there's, for all of its like intellectual density, there's a really interesting feeling of like non-deliberateness about it. That it, it does feel like instinctive kind of constellating and it's, it feels like poetry in that way. The assemblage that, feels like poetry. That's the feel I wanted to capture somehow, mm -hmm. you know, when I was writing it and it took lots of different forms, you know, mm -hmm. but, but in the end, that's kind of what I wanted. Yeah. Nailed it. All right. I was just wondering, is there a production of this play that we can see it? Not at the moment. Um, it is recorded because the play was meant to go on. Um, its press night was postponed because we went into lockdown on the, on the very night that we were supposed to um, premiere. And we recorded it for radio. 
um, and it was produced on Radio 3, so there is a recording of that production that actually never took place. It then went, it, you know what, it transferred to the National, to the Cottesloe. So a production that had never taken place transferred. To the National. <laughs> so it was, it was its, it had, it sort of, it, it already had, a, well, it had never had a press night. Mm. It never had that first night, but yet it had a transfer. Mm. So it was a transfer of a ghost play. So this idea of haunting, you know, continued through the production. Mm. Was, but, but the script is available for purchase. The script is available um, via Nick Hearn books, yeah. And it is a very satisfying read. That's how I consumed it, but yes. And may I just add, for those within the Yale community, um, a recording from the National Theatre is available through Orbis. Gosh, why didn't um, I remember that? Which is um, <laughs> how I got to see the play this afternoon, <laughs> and um, I'd encourage anyone who's got that access yeah. to take advantage of it. It's, um, Thank you. Sorry, can you say that one more time for everyone? I think I yeah. missed half of that. So those um, with a Yale Net ID uh, who have access to Orbis, etc., um, can search for the title of the play, and um, there is a recording of Great quality, a video, a video, thank you very much. A video recording. That's right, I, uh, why Parliament. did I forget that? There, we filmed it, yes, yes we did. Yeah. You know, it's like part of, part of um, the surface of this painting makes you want to say something like, you know, figuration is sort of drowning into abstraction, let's say, or is disappearing into abstraction. Um, but at another level, at a historical level, um, you know, we, we know that these bodies were already being abstracted by the commodification, by the, the value system of, of race. And um, there's like a, you know, such a rich history of thinking about abstraction in painting. Um, but there's a, a different way that abstraction works in theater because of the presence of bodies. Uh, and I, I'm wondering, again, this is just provocation for a few to keep talking, which I would love to keep listening to. Um, you know, can, um, how do you navigate the, the way that um, you know, theater seems to always be five steps behind in, a, in, its, in, a, in the ability to abstract, or, or seems to require a different kind of labor, maybe even like a non-visual labor, uh, in, in its ability to sort of work abstractly? Um, particularly when abstraction has been a real strategy to avoid some of the what, like Brenton had called some of the, the potential pornographies of, of abolitionist media. Um, how, how does theater sort of work with, with abstraction? I'm not sure I can answer that, actually. Um, I can take a stab. You can, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Well, you know, I think theater for me, you're right, it's a grounded medium that takes place in time mm -hmm. <laughs> with bodies, but it does ask sometimes you to suspend your understanding or, sorry, suspend your acceptance of the thing you see as being the thing you see. So it, it, it can work in allegory, right? I can walk on stage and go, I'm love. And then you gotta treat me like the idea of love as I speak and, you know, it becomes about sort of uh, alienating the viewer from what they think they see or, or tell themselves they see. You know, and I do think that there is a bit of this in your work. I mean, also if you think about mask work, you think about the fact that the, the, the phenomenon of actors playing their physical historical selves on stage is actually quite relatively new of an idea in the grand history of the theater, right? For so long and in most cultures, theater was mask work. It was bombastic costumes. It was sort of alterations to the silhouette that, and as a, actor's body, you were like a little man in a machine, <laughs> ultimately um, manipulating a larger illusion. And then you see sort of in the 19th century especially that people are suddenly kind of playing themselves, and yet you have something like the practice of blackface or even red face minstrelsy where white actors are putting red paint on themselves and claiming to be something else. So I feel like abstraction in the theater can happen on both the material level. I mean, we also have like, I'm very, I'm, I'm choking up here because I'm noticing Mark Robinson in the audience, so I don't want to like be called out for bullshit. But, um, <laughs> but you also can do it through language, right? I mean, that was sort of the great revolution of the early modernists, someone like um, 
Gertrude Stein, or even like the experimentations in off of Broadway in the 70s. So those toolkits have always maybe existed in some way. And I'd say that in my experience of your work, you know, for example, the scene you called up where we think we're watching a whipping, but then we realize it's actually a, a staged thing that's being filmed, you know, there's something abstract inside of that, right? That yeah. the, the illusion doesn't quite match this signifier. Yeah, absolutely, you know? and I, I think that in contemporary drama, this is what we aim for. So I, I don't think that most um, contemporary writers, I think that all contemporary writers are always dealing with this, are always finding ways to, um, to, to create that sense or, or sensibility that you're talking about or, or alluding to. I, don't you think? I think yeah. that's really what. I think it's a part of. I think it's a. You know, it's funny. Brecht, I mean. Yeah, I think it's. I mean, every. You know, every generation. Every. You know, if you look back over your theater history, every movement is about someone being like, "This is realism." You know. Yeah. And then you have this interesting thing happen in the 20th century where it's like we don't really care about realism. We want to talk about thought and concepts, and you know, that's just our inheritance. I think that's just somehow lives in the toolkit of what we do. But it sort of stretches back to my original point about like historical drama. You know. Do I really need a reenactment of the Salem witch trial? Is that really what I go no. to the crucible for? Or am I asking for something else, right? Yeah, am I asking we for want something else? Yeah, the experience of being in a mob and, you know, my, you know, it's about, it's almost, for me, like the affect game of theater is almost like religious mm -hmm. on some level, you know? And it really is about the associations you create inside of a viewer and, and the ways that you make them think and, and uh, horrify uh, them. Uh, or, and I think you know, language is really one of the ways in mm -hmm. which certainly for me, I think there is this beautiful um, potential in theatre for creating poetry, you know, and, and that is, um, you, you can, you have so many, um, you have so many things at your disposal as a dramatist, and language is one of them, because you, you create other worlds through language, you know, so, so we have this space on stage, but then you can, um, you also have spaces that are in people's minds, you mm -hmm. know, and so I, I think that um, it's, 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 it's so rich in that sense, because it isn't just what you see on the stage, it's what you create in the, mm. in the audience, where you can take them to, in terms of their thinking, but also in their own imaginations, because the theatre, you know, because they're also constructing it to some yeah. degree. You know, what group you see madness. is just exactly, yeah. is mm -hmm. what, sorry? Group madness. Yeah. It's a collective hallucination. <laughs> and you, you yeah. remind me of, your, of Tichuba. You know, there's a great yeah. moment where she's describing, I think, Mary, who's beginning to speak in tongues. But, yeah. but um, she's saying like a word that is perceived of by her it's father, true. Parrish, yeah. Yeah. as abstraction. Yes. But only Tichuba knows that she's actually repeating the indigenous words that yeah. she taught her as a child. Yeah. And that somehow felt, feels like an important aesthetic claim on your part, right? That it's almost a, um, it's about perception. You know, the, yeah. to perceive something abstract doesn't necessarily mean it is in and of itself an abstract thing. And that's mm -hmm. sort of an interesting provocation. Sorry, more questions. I just love to talk. OK. Well, there, I think we're. Wasn't there one more? Wasn't there one more? There was another question. They got shy. OK, well, listen, this has been a total joy, Winsome. And you know, you're you. here. You're Please come friend. to her reading uh, at 7 o'clock. That's right, Your final yes. hurrah. Our final, the last 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, they really, like I yeah. said, they make you work with this they money. Work, yeah. OK, um, thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, this has been amazing. Thank, thank you. Thank you for our technical support.